This is The Future Of, where experts share their vision of the future and how their work is helping shape it for the better. Hello, I'm David Carston. Mountain biking, an exhilarating outdoor adventure, is taking the world by storm. From conquering rugged trails to exploring diverse terrains, it offers a fantastic cardiovascular workout, enhancing your strength, endurance and agility. In fact, it's one of the fastest growing recreational activities globally. In this episode, I was joined by two experts in the field, Paul Braybrook, a dedicated paramedic and paramedicine researcher at Curtin University, and Rod Anier, Assistant Director of Parks and Visitor Services at the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions. We delved into the fascinating transformation of mountain biking from an extreme sport to thrilling family-friendly activity. We explored the development of dedicated mountain bike parks and trails and how you can enjoy the many health benefits of mountain biking while minimising risk and keeping your family safe. If you'd like to find out more about mountain biking safety, you can visit the links provided in the show notes. Gentlemen, would it be fair to say that you both have had the good fortune of seeing your passion for cycling and mountain biking uh, overlap with your professional careers? Paul? Professionally, I guess my exposure into mountain biking um, with the paramedicine side of things is we see when things go wrong. So um, when initially I came into doing a PhD in mountain biking, I was sort of approaching it from a multitude of angles. I had a sort of a professional interest from the, the paramedic side of things because it was a job we were seeing more frequently and it was a job we were going to and they're quite difficult jobs to manage. Personally, I obviously had a background in mountain biking, but not only that, but my son, he was about four-ish then, three, four or five, and he just started riding on trails with me, and we were taking him away to Market River and to Kalamunda, and he was riding. So I was seeing him sort of get into the sport, um, and then there was a, I saw a PhD come up, which was in mountain biking, looking at sort of the pre-hospital side of things, and yeah, it was perfect. It just sort of ticked every single box, I guess, for me. Um, yeah, on all professional, personal, sort of academic fronts. Uh, when you look at that on paper, Paul, yeah. it, it, it really couldn't get any better for you. Really. No, it was, re- it was written for me. <laughs> That's an excuse. <laughs> well, how about you, Rod? I mean, your, your background uh, professionally is, uh, well, now with the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, which uh, has been around uh, and you've been around long enough to have worked for that organisation when it was named uh, 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 under a different banner, yeah, is that correct? Many, many different banners, yeah. Mm. So I think I started even just before Calm. Um, so was there know, something before Calm, was yeah, there? Yeah, well, yeah, there was. A long, <laughs> long time ago. But anyway, yeah, uh, I've seen a few different name changes over the years. But, uh, yeah, my, my, I guess my professional and personal interest does kind of cross over there a bit with bikes. You know, I've always kind of had bikes and, uh, and loved them as a kid and then got involved in a lot of team sport and then came back to bike riding in the kind of late 90s, early 2000s when I stopped uh, the team sport stuff so much and I was looking for something to stay fit and hang out with mates and bikes were something I knew. So, And I caught the, caught the bug there and then I guess where it crossed over with what I do for a job is I came back to Perth. I was in uh, Pemberton for about 10 years, and I came back to Perth. I was working in Perth Hills, and one of the biggest uh, both recreation and nature conservation issues was around illegal mountain bike trails. So there was a huge boom in people wanting to ride, uh, but no places for them to do it legally. And so I was interested in bikes, but I was also interested in looking after the bush. So started looking at how we could make those thing, two things work together. And the thing that, that really got me interested is there are so many young people on bikes and that to me was a great opportunity to get people in the bush and get them to create a connection to the places that I love and that I want to protect and to try and you know, build the next generation of people who care about you know, lots of the parks and reserves that, that we manage. So yeah, that's how I got involved, I guess. You really touched on something there that, that is, I guess, fundamental to a lot of the experiences that, um, that, that a contemporary mountain biker really enjoys, and that is that, um, that connection with nature you talk about and, and doing it in such a way that is sustainable. That's, 
obviously been a, a massive part of your role in, in, in dragging uh, mountain biking into a, a modern context, in, into a, su- a sustainable context. Yeah, well, that's, I guess, where we're trying to head. Um, you know, we're part of the way there. I don't think we've gone on that full journey yet. Um, but, you know, it kind of, uh, mountain biking, uh, before even I was involved, was a bit of an underground thing. And part of the attraction, I think, to some of the people who were involved was to go and cut their own trails. And, you know, kids kind of for generations, when I was a kid, you know, you'd, you'd go and make trails around the neighbourhood. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't a new thing. And that kind of arc that we're on is is replicated all around the world. Um, but yeah, the, there's there's a really great opportunity to get people outdoors, to get kids doing something they love, to get families together doing something they love, and to connect them with places that need people who care. Because um, the worst thing is to have these magnificent national parks and places and have no one who cares about them. So my my job or part of my job, the way I see it, is to just create those next generation of people who care. And I don't care why they come or how they come. It's about trying to find the right place for them and the right conditions and the right facilities and protect the places that we want to protect, but also get them out there enjoying and being prepared to speak up for, um, you know, whatever the place is. Paul, maybe you can provide us with a little bit of context for, for those of us that aren't familiar with the sport. We may associate mountain biking with perhaps uh, that of, of years gone by, uh, an, an extreme sport, mm. particularly downhill. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's, it really has evolved into something that, uh, as, uh, you know, as Rod has mentioned, has become a family event mm-hmm. or a family, a family style activity. Can you explain to us how it's evolved and, and how it's become, I guess, more mainstream? Yeah, I mean, yeah, Rod, Rod's right. I mean, it way it started probably 70s and the 80s, um, the focus really, I mean, was really, when it's gone out of California, these were a few sort of quite radical guys who were taking old beat up steel bikes basically and throwing themselves down mountains and then modifying those bikes as best they could to try and manage these sort of downhill mountain biking trails. And it sort of stayed like this for maybe 10 years or so. And then there's a few like frame builders got involved and they started creating specific frames for these sort of sports. And then mountain bikes, as we know them, started to develop. Um, they're still very rudimentary, very heavy. So not really suitable for children at all. Um, only really in adult sizes. And it was still quite an extreme sport. And then as it's got more and more popular and the bikes and the technology have sort of developed along with that, it has become more approachable for children. And I think the generation of people who've started out doing this more extreme mountain biking, they then have children and they want to experience, you know, have their children experience these things. So then they've started to look for ways they can do that. Um, and that has obviously evolved it into more of the sort of family friendly as it is now. And that's run sort of concurrently with the work that Rod has been doing and you know, with developing trails which are suitable for, for families. There's various trails throughout WA I can or have been taking my son since he's been four years old and he's been capable of riding them because they're, they're built for all levels from you know brand new beginners into experienced riders. So much like a, a ski field now these, these exactly. trails are, yep. are graded. Exactly the same yeah. yeah so they should be graded you know green blue black are, are typically where we go or double black would be the very sort of extreme things um, and the idea is with consistency if you turn up to any mountain biking park or area and you see a green trail, you know you can probably ride that with you know, your new friend or your family or, uh, or someone who's new to the sport. Whereas when you move up through those grades, you know to expect more jumps, you know to expect bigger gaps, you know to expect things which are going to potentially cause you harm if you don't know what you're doing. So yeah, the grading has definitely made it a lot easier for, for families and, and beginners to sort of get into the sport. Now, there are quite a number of trails, organised trails, um, that have sprung up over the last decade or so, uh, uh, particularly around the southwest. Um, and a lot of thought has gone into their their location, their their location to in, in proximity to amenity and towns. Uh, Rod, can you explain to us a little bit uh, about the planning that's gone into this in, in yeah. terms of making it family friendly and accessible? Yeah. So I guess. Um when we and and those people involved in mountain biking started looking at how can we do this better, uh, we looked at other places around the world that had already gone through some of the experiences that we had. And part of that involved looking at where's the best place to put the trails. Um, 
what are the other opportunities they might bring with them. Uh, and some of that is around economic opportunity for uh, small towns um, and changing and diversifying the economy of those places. Uh, and so we did a lot of planning. And for a long time, I used to say when I went to give presentations about mountain biking that if Western Australians stood on the top of the pile of all the mountain bike planning we'd done, we could see all the trails being built in other states. Um, but that corner was turned probably five or six years ago where that really good planning base turned into action. So the sort of thing we did was we um, created a state strategy and that state strategy looked at all sorts of things from sport uh, to gender diversity, um, to facilities, trails, marketing, a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and we're actually on our second uh, state strategy now. So the first one, which was a 10 year strategy, um, wound up and we've created a second. And then the next part of that was around um, regional master plans. And these regional master plans dug into a bit more detail about where should the trails go? Um, and they were kind of looked at in, in three levels. So were they a national level ride location, a regional level ride location, or a local level ride location? And so you can probably tell from the names, a national level is gonna have more trail, it's gonna have perhaps more facilities, the regional perhaps a little bit smaller, a bit less trail, and then the local smaller again. Then we did a whole bunch of other things. Uh, one of the, I guess, critical things that was developed was some mountain bike management guidelines. And those guidelines gave a lot more detail about how a trail should be built and established what we use for all trails now, which is an eight step trail development process for Western Australia. And that, that process is an excellent way to make sure you step through all the things you need to do um, to get a good trail. So, you know, the idea, the initial idea, who's it for? Who's gonna maintain it? How are we gonna get the income to manage it and maintain it? Have we got neighbours that we need to speak to? And then it takes you through a whole lot of approvals around flora, fauna, Aboriginal sites, dieback, all those things you need to consider. Anyway, you follow that process and you get to the end and you get a good sustainable outcome. You don't follow the process, often you get stuck somewhere along the way is what we found. So it's, it's proven and, and, it, and, in, and in doing so, uh, how many, uh, I guess, organised trails or uh, sets of trails and complexes, shall we say, or facilities do we have dotted around the state now as of 2023? Um, well, I, I, I reckon probably since we wrote that first st state strategy, there's, there'd be close maybe a hundred million dollars has gone into developing trails. Um, and the locations now that between state government, local government and private facilities, you've probably got 15 or 20 pretty decent locations. Um, there's probably three or four kind of national level locations and a few other kind of aspiring and then a bunch of smaller ones. but. Yeah, we don't have a shortage anymore of trails and there's plenty of places to go. I'll quote, quote the field of dreams, if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. And is that apparent, Paul? Are they, uh, uh, you know, have we seen a spike and a bit of a boom in, in uh, participation in this growing sport? Yeah, the, I guess the, the Ausplay surveys, which is what we look at for participation in sport, um, they seem to be the most sort of longest going well-rounded surveys of participation. They seem to show a very steady increase in, in mountain biking um, nationally and in the state as well. Um, when we looked, or when I looked personally at, at ambulance attendances for, for these cases, we saw um, a bigger increase. So that's one, I guess, disparity we have seen is the, is the number of ambulance attendances has disproportionately increased beyond the participation of the, um, the sport itself. Well, well, that's very interesting. Uh, what, what sort of injuries uh, are being seen? So um, minor injuries. Basically, so to, to go through, I guess, some of the figures and um, to break it down from one of my studies. So um, we looked at all ambulance attended mountain bikers in Western Australia over a six year period. So and we, we had a very robust process of identifying these. 
which involved me locking myself in a dark room for extended periods of time, uh, reading through thousands and thousands of case sheets to make sure we'd identified every single case, which was possibly a mountain biker. We then excluded um, as many as we could that were mountain biking in parks or you know, down the local shops or any of these sort of places. Well, we're left with this really robust data set. And then what we did is then we then classified, um, so when a paramedic attends a, an uh, injured person like this, they will typically um, classify the injuries that they find. So I found they have an obvious deviation in the fracture of the right arm or they have a dislocated shoulder or they have abrasions or lacerations. So we took all of that information as well. And then we took the vital signs. So when I attend you, I take your pulse, your blood pressure, your oxygen saturations, your respiration rate. I take all of these things and that builds me up a picture of you. From those vital signs, you can calculate something called a NEWS score, N-E-W-S. And it's basically a, a score which tells um, a hospital person how sick you are. So when they take your vital signs in hospital, that will trigger depending on what the news score is, a response. So we found that they're really good to use these pre-hospitally to indicate how sick somebody is or not sick someone is. For, for triaging? Yeah, for, well, post-triage. Right. So after the triage has been done to see if they're improving or deteriorating. But we found really good, this good evidence that shows that if you use them pre-hospitally, it's got a really good predictive capability for 30-day mortality and morbidity and other things as well. So you can use them pre-hospitally and you can use them retrospectively, which is great for our data set. So then when we took all this information, Predominantly, mountain bikers are injuring um, upper limb injuries. So shoulder girdle, um, wrists, and arms, basically, which is consistent with the mechanism I guess you'd expect to see when you come off a mountain bike, outstretched arms. You, it's a protective mechanism, so you're seeing these upper, upper body injuries. Um, around 20% of all the injuries were head injuries, which was it was interesting because we actually did the, the same study with, with hikers, and they also had 20% of head injuries. So hikers and mountain bikers had the same amount of, of head injuries. And what we think is the reason they had the similar amount was not because um, hiking was particularly high. We think that mountain biking head injuries with the number was actually particularly low because of the protective mechanisms exactly. So having good quality helmets, um, having good quality PPE, which is preventing more sort of head injuries from taking place. Then in terms of the severity of these sort of presentations, so how severe they, they were, and if we, if we look to look at them from a hospital perspective, how severe would they present? Very minor, so really, really minor. So we're seeing lots of the scrapes, abrasions, lacerations, shoulder girdle injuries, but they're not very sick. These people are not overall a sick cohort of people. So comparatively, are you saying that the injuries sustained uh, in a mountain biking incident are, are generally not too bad? Completely. If you look at the, the risks of participating in it and what you are likely to come out with from participating in it versus the risks of let's say, a uh, sedentary lifestyle. So physical inactivity is a, is a good example. Um, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare have just published some data in August this year, which specifically looked at physical inactivity and what's the implications of, of physical inactivity. So around, if you combine someone who is physically inactive with obesity, those risk factors account for about 10% of the entire disease burden in Australia, which is huge. So 10% of the entire disease bur burden is something which is preventable and something we can modify. Not only is it preventable, when studies have looked into people who undertake exercise, like cycling, for example, they've found the biggest benefits you can get for your health. The cohort of people who get the biggest benefits of their health when they undertake cycling is not the people who are already cycling. It's the people who are already physically inactive and who are obese. So it means if you can encourage people like Rod's team is trying to do to undertake this sport who don't necessarily undertake it now, they're the ones who are likely to see the biggest health benefits. So the emphasis really is not on trying to get people to cycle more who already are. It should be on getting people who aren't undertaking these sports out into nature and enjoying it because that's where we're going to see the health benefits. Well, just on that, if... if a listener is sitting there thinking, well, you know what, I'm a bit risk averse. I'm a, I'm a little bit worried about some of those, um, those injuries that you've, you've uh, mm. highlighted that aren't as bad as they could be. Um, yep, yep. Uh, how has uh, the sport and the technology attached to the sport uh, actually evolved to, to better protect yep. riders? Yep, massively. So um, helmet development, we can look at that even in the last 10 years. Mountain biking helmets is 
It used to be people were wearing a very standard road-based helmet for mountain biking. And the problem with these was they have, um, they sit quite high on your head. They have very little protection for sort of the base of the skull and around here. And a lot of mountain bikers are hitting their head, as we know, when they crash. Newer helmets now, they extend much further down on the head, so you're protecting the base of skull. Uh, most people I see now who are riding a downhill trail will be wearing a full face helmet, I would say. Rod, would you yeah. tend to agree? To protect, yeah. the, protect yeah. the jaw. So you have a, a good full face helmet, which um, it, it'll protect your jaw, it'll protect your teeth, it'll protect your tongue, it'll protect all this sort of stuff. Teeth are expensive. Teeth are expensive. Yeah. Um, these have been probably around for over 10 years, but the problem with them was they were previously very heavy, very hot. They just weren't well suited to sort of the Western Australian environment particularly. Mm. The ones now are really well ventilated. They're so much lighter. They're not even much heavier than a regular sort of helmet now. They're built so well. So things like full face helmets are incredible. We're seeing a lot more people who are, are riding downhill wearing neck braces to prevent neck injuries, which is great. Um, and just simple things like knee pads and elbow pads. So when you do crash, which you will and everyone does crash, we know from my research, the majority of injuries are lacerations, abrasions, these mm. kind of things. You can prevent that. It's really easy to prevent that. So whilst there is risk involved in it, I would argue that the risk is is far less than not taking part in any sport, to be perfectly honest. Rod, it's, uh, it, it, it's an exciting moment for the sport uh, to see it grow as it has and, and to actually meet the demand uh, from, a, from a facility per perspective. Um, what do the next 10 years hold if you've worked out that strategy? Yeah, well, I think different things in different places um, and probably different things for different people. I'll start with what I'm, I hope happens and, and what I have seen happen in other places and that idea that people who get connected with the environment become advocates and they start not to just give back to the trails, which is, is what a lot of people do at the moment by helping maintain them or donating but they actually give back more broadly to the environment that the trails are located in. And that might be through weed control, it might be through replanting programs, or just for advocacy for those places. And we're seeing that in other places around the world. Um, so the users turn into the next advocates for those places. So that's, that's one thing I really hope happens. Uh, one thing that is happening already and will continue to happen is that idea that um, trails, and in this case mountain bike trails, will bring a change to some of the small towns in the southwest in particular. Um, so places like Dwelling Up, Collie, Pemberton, Nanup, uh, even down at Walpole now, we're going to see and or are already seeing new uh, businesses being established on the back of the trails uh, and I think that will continue to grow and there'll be uh, a broader economy that's built on the trail visitors. Uh, so that's exciting as well, um, exciting for, for those places, but also as a trail user. Um, so that, that I think will be something to look forward to. Uh, it, it really is uh, an activity that, that ticks so many boxes in terms of, of, of involvement from uh, all levels of experience, uh, gender, age, uh, in terms of families, this must be such a revelation for, for so many new families coming to the sport. I mean, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, uh, look, some of those towns that have really grasped the idea and businesses that have really grasped the idea are seeing huge benefits and are attracting those families. So a place, say at Margaret River, there's is really quite a modest trail network there, but it's a really nice little pocket park. It's good for beginners, um, but if you're a more experienced rider, there's enough to interest you there as well. And there's there's a few businesses that have built up just around that trail network that were initially one accommodation business there that's right on the trail network was incredibly surprised that their whole market changed overnight. Um, and so now people are booking a year ahead. They, they have their holiday and they're booking a year ahead. Um, the hire services are going nuts in some places. You know, the shuttle services, this transfer services, all these things that are kind of growing up um, around around the trails. And that's, that's really exciting to see. But it's also really, like mountain biking, like, like 
lots of activities. And I, I don't think of it so much as a sport. There's a sport component of it, but that's really probably the smallest part. Um, but even within the sport and within the activity itself, mountain biking brings a really nice vibe. You get people together. It's like if you imagine being in a ski town, you're in the resort, you all go out to ski during the day, you stop for lunch, you talk skiing, you finish at the end of the day, you boast about how awesome you were or how the fall you had or why your arm's in a sling or whatever. Mountain biking's the same. So you go to places and you have that whole experience where everyone's there for the same thing. Uh, and that's really cool. It's really cool to be part of. Uh, and it just creates a really a great vibe for the place. I was wondering about that, having not experienced it myself, whether or not that this, this, this growth and uptake of this activity, you know, whether the, the facilities can support it and, uh, you know, whether there ever is any, you know, crowding or, or um, yeah, any, any moments where there, there might be uh, conflicts, a strong word. But do you know what I mean? Like yeah, when, when, when something becomes hugely popular, there's a, a huge demand placed on resources has it happened yet, or are we still at a really sort of sweet spot uh, in the um, in, in the development of of, of yeah. this network? Of, I don't of think we've reached the point where we've got more people using the trails than they're capable of accommodating. Um, one of the big challenges we've got is working out how we better maintain what we've now got. So it's 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 easy in the planning to say we're going to create this model and it's going to be self-sustaining and people are going to contribute. But there's a lot of work to do to make that happen. And and there is some great models out there like the Bibbulmun Track Foundation and Mundabidi Trail Foundation where you've got these fantastic user groups who help you maintain the trails. Um, but we need to do more than that. And around the world, there's a whole bunch of different models we've looked at. Some of them are direct where users pay, so you pay to play. Um, and some of them are indirect, um, you know, some places which are trail destinations and, and other kinds of destinations have bed taxes, for instance, or they intercept some landing fees in Tassie. You know, you go there now, you're an international visitor, apart from Aussies, you pay a fee to, to come and that goes back into helping maintain uh, what you're going there for in the first place. Uh, so there's, a, there's still some work to do on that. Um, we're part of the way there, but we need to do more to embed all those things so we have a really sustainable model to work with. It must be such an exciting thing for you, both personally and professionally, to have been there for this entire phase of, uh, I guess, of, of development and then progress into this next 10 year block. Yeah, it, it is exciting and, and it has been really rewarding. Um, and yeah, there's lots of things that haven't gone well and there's so much more that has gone well. Uh, but mountain bikers, the really you know, hardcore mountain bikers are a pretty tough crowd too. So they always want more. Um, so the really regular, you know, committed riders who've been there for the long haul, they're always looking for more and more and more and more. So they're a pretty hard crowd to please. Um, but putting that to one side, you know, mountain biking, if you think of it like a pyramid, that really hardcore, really experienced, super skilled riders are right at the top of the pyramid. And they're a very small part of the market. The main part is right down the bottom. It's those newbies, it's the people who've got a mountain bike in the shed and they might use it once or twice a year. It's the families, it's, you know, that's, that's where most of the people are. Um, so it's yeah, trying to get that balance between catering for the highly skilled, highly motivated, and also catering for the masses. Well, Paul, talking about the masses, uh, in, in terms of getting started in this activity as a family, how do you suggest uh, families best prepare themselves uh, to enjoy this safely? Yep. Um, going to somewhere with facilities is a great idea. As, as Rod was saying about the, the place um, down south, there is a campsite down south where they have bike hire there, you can stay there overnight, it's on the trailhead. So we've taken friends down there before and families who've come with us who've never ridden before and the trails are easy easy to ride. You have bikes accessible to them and you have somewhere to stay which is on the trailhead in the middle of Margaret River effectively. So you get to stay in the, in the center of Margaret River. So you can approach that and you can hire a bike and you can go for a ride and you can sort of dip your toes in the water and see if you enjoy it or not. Um, 
But in terms of, of sort of, I guess, doing it safely, um, there's always, whenever you hire a bike, you always have access to helmets, you always have access to protective gear, so they always give you the sort of the main protective items that you need. Um, and if you don't have those things, these typically are the sort of stuff which are not expensive. Um, protective gear from elbow pads, knee pads, things like this is not expensive. Helmets can be if you want to get a really good helmet. Uh, personally, I, would re I always recommend to everyone, don't skimp on your helmet. If you're going to skimp on anything, whatever it may be, don't make it the helmet because that's the thing that's going to save your life. Um, so yeah, apart from helmets, you can, you can set yourself up pretty cheaply. Rod. Yes. For many years, World Rally came to Perth and a lot of their uh, stages were raced in the forests of the southwest and the drivers would note particularly the challenge of driving on our pea gravel yeah. as being something quite unique. Uh, as a, a, a budding trail rider, a mountain biker, new to the activity, are there skills that need to be learned to prepare yourself for, for, for our surfaces in yeah. the southwest? Yeah, look, that's a really good point. And uh, some of the West Australian riders who've become elite um, credit the fact mm. that they cut their teeth on pea gravel that honed their skills. But when you start out, um, you know, you go skiing, when you learn to ski, you go and do some lessons. So one of the first things you do is you get your gear and then you book in for a lesson and then you go and try out what you've learned. I'd really encourage people, if you're going to get into mountain biking in any kind of serious way, is just do a few lessons with a coach and you'll learn some really basic skills around cornering, around distribution of your weight, uh, just some key skills around braking that are going to make your experience of the trail so much better and it's going to build your skill level very quickly. And so rather than learning lessons through mishaps, you might avoid some of those, um, those mishaps. So you'll stay on two wheels rather than face planting or washing your front wheel out. So yeah, just a few really quick tips. Some of the clubs do this as well. So you, joining a club can be a good thing as well. And you'll learn um, as a, a newbie through um, other people talking to you about riding. Even basic things like um, you know, tyre pressure can be so critical and if you don't know that and you go in with rock hard tyres and you're wondering why everyone else is cornering so easily and you're skidding all over the place, um, yeah, it can be a bit disconcerting. So yeah, get some local knowledge and a coach can be a good place to start. Well, Paul, even if you have that, there is still the scenario that often occurs where ambition outweighs talent. Uh, what are the paramedics noting as one of the major contributors to those minor injuries that they're seeing? Yeah, so we did some really good keyword analysis of um, text written by the paramedics. So when I attend a job, I would write a case sheet and the case sheet would contain a quite a detailed description of what I found, you know, what occurred, what treatment was given. So we did some keyword analysis in here and we found around 25% of all of those case sheets for mountain biking incidents um, concerned the word jump or jumping or <laughs> jumped. So we know jump has something to do with um, why people are coming off their bikes in a lot of cases. And this is obviously probably a, a massive underreport. These are just the cases we found with that word in it. Um, speaking anecdotally, if I see my son land a jump on his front wheel one more time, I'm going to scream because... He is new to this, and as Rod has sort of alluded to with coaching, his only coaching has been from his dad, who has told him a hundred times not to land a jump on his front wheel, and yet he continues to do so. And I think what we're seeing in the wider community is as you do step up through the levels, so you go from a green to a blue trail, you're probably not that experienced with taking jumps, and then you add in extra speed, you add in, as Ross said, the pea gravel, which is like riding on marbles, all of these factors, and then you throw in a jump as well, which you're taking with a high velocity, there's a good chance you're not going to land that jump if you don't know what you're doing. So I would 100% echo what Rod said in terms of get coaching, or if you're not going to get coaching, step up slowly. Just work your way up to things. Don't You, would, you wouldn't go skiing, to use that analogy, and throw yourself down a, down a black run, so don't do it in mountain biking. Fair advice, fair advice. And look, just on your son, I would suggest that perhaps if someone else would give him the same advice, he'd listen. It's just because you're his dad. Well, I can tell you a story about my son. <laughs> so 
he was desperate to go over mountain biking with just his dad. So we arranged a weekend away down in Margaret River, ju- just me and him doing mountain biking for two days. Day one on the first trail, he had his full face helmet and he had his regular helmet. And he said, I don't want to wear my full face helmet, it's too hot. And I said, yep, no worries, son. I'll carry your full face helmet, you wear your regular helmet. So he threw himself down his first trail, went over the handlebars, put his tooth through his lip. And then I had a very awkward conversation with his mum, who rightly said, why wasn't he wearing his full face helmet? <laughs> to which I had to say, yeah, I told him he couldn't, he could not wear his full face helmet. So yeah, we learned, we learned the hard way, unfortunately, from that. Uh, it's not the jumps that are the problem. It's yeah. the it's the landing. Or lack of, yeah. <laughs> Look, you're both uh, part of this this growth area, uh, coming at it from two, uh, I guess, different angles, but overlapping at the same mm-hmm. time. How have your paths crossed professionally? So I, um, when I initially started this PhD um, into the research around the incidents that were occurring. Rod had already been doing some sort of work in the background around incidents as well. So my supervisor sort of made the introduction to us and um, we've had a few discussions from there about sort of where we want research to go and and other areas we think we can explore because what my data has done sort of from an epidemiological point of view is, is, you know, who's getting injured, where are they getting injured, what kind of injuries are they getting? We have all this information now. But the next ultimate question is really why are these injuries occurring? And that's not something you necessarily get from a a macro epidemiological study. That's something you need to really do at a a micro level. Or I can sit down with my son and say, why did you crash? What were you doing to cause yourself to crash? And try and understand the kinds of things which are causing these crashes. And then once we know that, Rod can obviously make implementations to sort of prevent those things from occurring. Rod, has that been a real benefit? Oh, absolutely, yeah. We're, we're really data hungry, um, so we want to keep people safe, so we want them out there, but in whatever we do, whether it's walking, you know, mountain biking, climbing, whatever they're doing, we want people to be there but to be safe. So the more we know about the mechanisms that are leading to people um, coming unstuck, the more we can address that either through design, better design, through better information to people, uh, and perhaps it might be through better recommendations around what level of skill or how you need to approach a trail, uh, or it might just be the marking on the trail, how we, how we do it. So there's a whole range of different things we can do once we have a bit more information. I think the really good thing is out of, out of the learnings that we've got already is that for the most part, the injuries aren't really bad. Mm. So it's not like, we're creating this, you know, huge uh, storm of, of injuries and, and issues for people. Um, and for the most part, it's a good experience and good outcomes that people have. So it's around the edges of what are those things or those types of trails that are more likely to lead to problems and how can we better either design or communicate to, to stop that happening. It's uh, really uh, exciting and, well, I guess, refreshing to see... Uh, an activity that uh, that I guess has so much impact within uh, uh, the, the forest, uh, actually being I guess endorsed and worked with by the DBCA, who see this as a, as an opportunity to embrace people who are embracing our, our wildlife and and our our flora. Um, it, it's it's a real credit I think to uh, to the organisation for taking this on and and helping I, I guess local economies around the southwest uh, and and seeing the potential of this as a, as a way like you say of connecting us back with nature perhaps in a in a, a more modern or a slightly different way to what we're used to yeah look I, I guess my approach to it is fairly pragmatic one and that is there are so many people out there doing it that if we don't do it in a sustainable way they're going to do it anyway we don't have the resources to be out there to stop people doing all the crazy things that they might want to do. So we need to approach it from a proactive point of view and say, how can we turn this around and instead of it being an issue, um, turn it into something positive? Uh, and you know, there, there's, there's other examples out there where um, the type of outcome that we've got from mountain biking, we need to start, so you know, off-road motorbikes for any, as an, another example, you know, there's people out there cutting up all over the place. And the problem with that is you can buy one legally, 
but there's really no place to legally ride it. So with mountain biking, it was a similar kind of issue. Um, and we've had some really good outcomes and made great progress. So I'm proud that we've been able to do that and to look at it from a, what's the opportunity, not what's the problem. But just ignoring it and saying, oh no, you can't come here, you can't come here, was never ever gonna cut it and it would never work. Well, Rod, Paul, it's been a, a really uh, fascinating chat at, a, at a, I guess, a really important juncture for the activity as it, as it grows and as you look down, uh, I guess, the barrel of the next 10 years of, of its development here in Western Australia. Thanks very much for coming in and, and talking to us about it. You're welcome. Thanks yeah. for having us on. Yeah, my pleasure. You've been listening to The Future Of, a podcast powered by Curtin University. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it. And if you want to hear more from experts, stay up to date by subscribing to us on your favourite podcast app. Bye for now.